Welcome to the Time for a Reset podcast, the podcast where I, Paul Frampton, interview senior marketeers on the big issues of the day and the thing that they want to see reset uh, with an ever-changing landscape. Welcome back to another episode of Time for a Reset. This afternoon, I'm joined by Ben Rhodes. Uh, Ben was previously the Group Marketing Director of Royal Mail um, and has had an illustrious career in marketing. Uh, So really pleased to have Ben on. Hello, Ben. How are you? I'm good. Thank you, Paul. Really, really glad that I could join you. And we're going to, as usual, start um, with uh, our killer question, which is, what is the thing that if you had a magic button or a magic wands that you would hit reset uh, within marketing? And then we'll uh, take the conversation from there. Brilliant. So what would I reset? Well, what I'd reset, the thing that irritates me the most is this constant uh, siren call of the next normal. Um, uh, as if we are moving into a world where everything can be predicted um, and orchestrated uh, in, a, in a really simple and structured way. I, I think it's a misnomer. Um, and I think um, the more that management consultants talk about this, the more wary marketeers need to be about it. Because I don't think there is anything like normal. I don't think there ever has been a normal. What's normal for me will not be what's normal for you, Paul. Um, and, uh, and, and I just don't think uh, that it's the right attitude to have um, uh, to, uh, for businesses. I think we're moving into a world where uh, you've got rapid and have and have actually for the last decade had rapid changes in consumer behavior, specifically around e-commerce, but in other areas too. Um, and I think you've got a, a technology environment where with, with mobile, with AI, with machine learning, with 5G coming down the line, where um, we're going to be uh, uh, effectively uh, operating in a brand new world. Uh, with tons and tons and tons of different commercial opportunities arriving and different um, consumer behaviours happening. You know, Tom Goodwin talks about, you know, um, that today's world being very similar to the 1920s when the national grid was set up and houses started getting electricity. No one knew then that, you know, people would have microwaves and mobile phones and electric cars and hair dryers and washing machines. Those things simply didn't exist. And in many ways, we are entering into an exact same type of period. So talk about a new normal or the next normal is I think a misnomer. Great. And so do you, do you think that means that everything's changed and nothing's changed? Or like some people would argue that the discipline of marketing and growing a business, actually the, st- the strategic way that you use marketing hasn't changed just the tools and the consumer behavior has others would argue largely those from the technology community that everything's changed and the technology is driving everything so where, where do you sit on that that uh, equation so i think uh, you know i i'm you know i, I i'm an, a sort of a ad man at heart i guess i was tra- that's how i was kind of trained up so i'm I, I am a huge proponent of the unchanging man which i think was the, the phrase and the unchanging woman you know humanity hasn't really evolved um, that much in the last million odd years we've got the same motivations emotionally that drive us to do things whether that's fear greed reassurance what what whatever self-fulfillment hope confidence um those are those those main drivers they don't really change I, i'm not saying that, that that i mean those are normal i guess um, uh, um but the world we're operating in is changing i think quite quickly uh, and, and what i worry about is is the mindset that um, which is actually just a bit lazy, which says that, you know, uh, I can predict exactly what's going to happen because I, I just don't think, I just don't think we can. I think, I think that mindset leads to huge amounts of missed opportunity um, and, uh, uh, and, a, uh, and a kind of, as I say, a sort of complacency um, about, um, uh, you know, the, the, the extra value that yeah. is sitting on the table that people just aren't tapping into. And all these new tools with technology and, uh, and what have you allow you to um, really uh, unlock that value. But you can't do that if you're thinking that it's just, you know, set, you know back to a kind of a new BAU. Uh, that, and that's what I kind of, um, you know, I find yeah. uncomfortable. I hear you. I hear you. And so I guess there's also this, this friction between 
building brand and, um, and, and, and all that comes with that trust and uh, loyalty over time and long term, what I guess in um, the, the Binit work from IPA is called the long part of it. And then there's the short part of it, which is the performance digital mindset. And I mean, even before COVID, we were uh, seeing a shift towards more short term, quarter by quarter performance marketing orientation. Do you think that's a mistake? I mean, I think, uh, I think a couple of points. I think the first thing is that even in the good times um, over the last 20 years, um, businesses have stopped investing in building brands. Um, yeah. I, there are, of course, exceptions. But I think on the whole, the move um, to um, more performance-led um, marketing approaches away from brand building um, is a pretty good indicator um, that businesses are thinking very short term, not long term, uh, and uh, and the problem with that is is that brands, you know, the whole point of having a brand is is in a world where most products in a category inevitably, you know, regress to a norm, they become sort of the same with the same features and the same benefits. Yeah. Um, if you don't have a strong brand, um, then you know it's very difficult to charge. Uh, more than your competitors so you end up as a commodity and then you know frankly the lowest cost wins um, and you know that is no way to run a business over the long term um, but unfortunately I think a huge you know huge swathes of industry um, have kind of fallen into that model they've they sort of believe this lie that you, that you can build a brand without spending any money uh, or not spending very much and actually all you just need to be doing is a bit of advertising um, and it doesn't matter if it's performance or not. And of course, you know, that, that, that unravels pretty quickly and all the work that, you know, Bennett and Field have done over the years, you know, is starting to build an empirical base for that to show that. Um, now, your second point around how do you build a brand in a crisis? I mean, is, let's be honest, really, really difficult. Mm. Um, my, my, my advice would be, and certainly when I was at Royal Mail, my advice to the business there was, what we need to do is double down on the basics. We've got to really go back to our foundations and we've got to make sure that across, to begin with, just the channels that we own, right. we are consistent and we are strategically coherent um, with you know, what, our, what our brand is. Now, at Royal Mail, you know, the, the you know, 500 year old company steeped in, in history, but at its heart, was a core essence around the democratization of trade and communication. The whole point of Royal Mail when it was set up was that everybody has access, no matter where they are or who they are, that they can send and they can trend, trade to people. Mm. Um, that, that was at the heart of it. So in our kind of, you know, um, as we went through lockdown, I think what they're starting to do now as well is, is, um, is to, uh, through, just through their own channels to begin with, before they go into pay, you know, paid channels, um, is to start, you know, really just kind of promoting that again, which is all about connecting the nation, being there in very difficult times, making sure people, if they're stuck at home and what have you, can get uh, what they need um, through their postman, via their postman. And I think, you know, so bringing the nation together and actually connecting everybody is what's at the heart. And, and, you know, they're just doing that through their own channels to begin with. Then they're moving into social and they're moving into PR um, and they're sort of getting some kind of earned value as well. Um, and at some point, they will start to promote that through um, through paid media. But you know, it's about understanding what your core proposition is and what your positioning is, um, and then just kind of building that out. And I, and I think you know, certainly, I think what we'll find is that there will be some businesses, organisations with fairly deep pockets, um, that will invest in brand communications, um, and you know. Uh, over the longer period, I think, I suspect um, that they will come out a lot better yeah. than the brands who either have just done nothing but could have done something um, or, or brands that, that, that are still trading, but they just focus purely on performance. Um, I, I think that'd be a mistake. Yeah, no, I, I, I hear you. And that, that sounds like a very, very rational argument. And, and I suppose, I mean, if, if, marketing were easy and simple and everybody just followed the same course which there is a danger <laughs> that that's the world we're heading to that 
everyone's competing in the same search social kind of programmatic channels for the same audiences that actually a marketeer's job to your point is to determine a strategy that differentiates um, that creates um, a, a unique um, brand position versus the market and create sustainable growth for the future. So with, with all that said, it feels like actually there's never been a more important time for uh, kind of marketing around the board table yet, probably because of the world we're in, HR has got a bigger seat at the board table because businesses are restructuring and looking at remote workforces and everything else. And then the real, real estate people are at the table because obviously people are deciding whether to divest in offices. So is there... Is there, is there space for the marketer to take on a broader role? Do you think marketing's become more important in the last few years or is it is it struggling to kind of maintain that voice at the board table? Gosh. Um, oh, sorry, uh, that was a lot of questions. That's a big question. So, I, 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 right, so, so my weasel answer is it depends on the <laughs> but But in a more generic level, um, I think um, you only have to look at CMO tenure to know that there's an issue. So the, I think the average CEO tenure is five or six years. Yeah. The average chief marketing officer tenure, this is globally, is I think just over three years. Now I a massive, that's yeah, just now, um, 19 months. <laughs> yeah, so well, there you go. So a massive, massive problem with that, with these kind of short yeah. stints, is that you end up with tactical solutions to strategic problems. Unfortunately, you can't add up a whole load of tactics to make a strategy. You can, however, have a strategy and divide that up into loads of tactics. But that's not what's happening. And I think part of, and, and, and this is a real issue for the marketing community, because what, what it means is that marketers are usually the only people in the business that are able to operate at the nexus of both technology and customer and communication. You'll have sales organizations that look out and talk to customers, of course, but they know nothing about technology and they know nothing really about communications, but they're very good at closing deals. Um, mm -hmm. But no other part of an organization looks outwards. Finance looks inwards, HR looks inwards. Yeah. Um, operations is inwards. So, so th there is this huge, huge problem if CMOs are just not representative for businesses. And, and, and it is a massive issue when you're in a period of crisis and therefore turnaround and transformation to grow. Because what you need to have um, are powerful voices that are customer centric, because after all businesses are there to serve customers, that's how they make the money. Um, to, to shape propositions and then to work with operations and with HR and with technology to bring that to life. Um, and I think it's a real, real risk for commerce and for business if, um, you know, if, if, if that marketing voice isn't, isn't at the table. It becomes a very rational conversation uh, and, not, and not a customer centric one. Right. Yeah. And I, I can imagine also quite exhausting for the, for the CMO if they've got to constantly be that voice bringing the outside in and the customer perspective and the customer and tech perspective when perhaps other folks around the table don't have the level of understanding around um, some of the changes in consumer behavior or technology. I mean, it might, might, sounds like it must be a pretty exhausting role, is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yes, it is. Um, uh, it's an extremely exhausting role. Um, and I think, um, and I'm not going to profess to, to, to have, have, you know, have all the answers at all. I think the, um, it, it, what, I think increasingly the profile, almost the psychometric of a CMO is, is, is becoming different, has to become different. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of, you know, marketing, if you go back in history, marketing, uh, you know, kind of came out of advertising sales. That, that's really where it came out of, the kind of media and creative landscape to help businesses buy better advertising for their products and services. And, and, and that's kind of how marketing was sort of born in the 70s. That's where it came from. Um, so you tended to have a certain type of person that would, that would go into marketing. But organizations now are very different. There's a lot more um, kind of uh, silos and functional areas that have been built up over time. There's a lot more uh, accountability is spread in different ways in different organizations. 
Um, and so if you're going to be this person who, who is trying to pull, you know, create a brand, you know, a strategy for your brand um, and, you know, a growth strategy um, that works across customer experience, uh, product development, innovation, R&D, insight, communication, um, you know, you've got to have um, quite a toolkit um, in your kind of leadership skills to be able to to kind of do that you've also got to have a board that want to listen right absolutely um and and you know that's not necessarily true um when you're in a crisis where people are just kind of doubling down and focusing on um you know the operational piece you know keeping our staff safe um etc um so i think i think that's you know it is a real challenge mm. yeah and i i guess <laughs> with all of the as you say all the priorities in a in a crisis um things can slip down the, the, that agenda list, can't they? Um, and yeah, yeah, but you do need to, you know, you know businesses do, you know, they, they, they've got sources of revenue, right? So, you know, they, they, they do have to be focused on um, how, how you get that revenue in. Um, and I think as we are, as people are getting used to um, the kind of social distancing, and the rules and regulations over that, and, and I know it's very difficult because they, they do change um, as a government tries to balance, yeah. you know, opening the economy or keeping people safe. But I think as 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 organisations get used to having to operate in a different way, um, I, I think the conversation will turn, if it hasn't turned already, away from how do we keep people safe and how do we trade to right how are we actually going to make some money now yeah. because we've probably been understanding still all going backwards for a period of time how how are we going to turn that around yeah yeah and i guess and then how do you get back to some form of growth sustainably um given yeah I, yeah i mean i think i mean the, i mean the interesting thing though is a lot of businesses um uh, uh, have seen massive declines in some parts of their business um but in other parts you know yeah. surprising buoyancy yeah yeah uh, now it hasn't necessarily netted out um the, the you know the, the ons and the offs um but i, I was i was i was chatting to a, to, to a pal today who who um runs a, a very big research firm uh, and he was saying you know one part of the business is massively down the whole ad tracking side of things um but actually all the stuff they're doing around government work and testing and stuff like that has gone you know gone through the roof so actually they're sort of all right right um it's a bit complicated from a people perspective but actually from a kind of balance sheet perspective they're kind of all right so now you know he's starting to think about how do i take this forward which i think is really interesting and i guess i guess it goes back to your point earlier around there is no such thing as normal and therefore you need to constantly be keeping an eye on behavioral change and investing in new spaces so you've got a diversified proposition and portfolio otherwise there is a danger that things do rapidly change. And like you talked about, if you go back to the Victorian times when suddenly electricity comes along and the canals and the mills and everything else are redundant overnight, at least you're, you're in better shape. It doesn't mean you can pivot entirely, but if, you, if you've not done nothing to invest in the future and experiment, then it's very difficult in times of crisis to, to, to turn things around. Yeah, and I think a lot of that is about culture which is which i think is actually where that nexus between the kind of the the marketeer and the and hr kind of and, and kind of operations come together quite nicely if you if you can if you can kind of create that that kind of that holy trinity because um businesses can't transform and be agile and nimble and seize opportunities um if they've got the wrong policies they've got the wrong culture they've got the wrong sort of set of processes and capabilities to be able to evolve. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's harder for regulated businesses to evolve because they've got a regulator that wants them to achieve certain standards, but not all businesses are regulated. Um, but you've got to have that culture, which means that you need to have um, a, a CMO who's looking to customers and seeing how behavior is changing and technology is changing and where value pools are and how to tap into them. You know, having a very very open conversation with hr around people policies um, and with operations around how your your processing is working and how all of this adds up yeah. to allow you to kind of shift and change um, as the market moves 
And I think, you know, that's, again, it goes back to your other your point around kind of the CMO voice and role at the board level. That's why it's really important. Because if you haven't got an outside, you know, a person looking outside, surveying the, the market and the trading conditions and what's happening, and then feeding that back in, you're never going to get that organic change. No, absolutely. And a, a lot of other, other folks that I've, I've chatted to on this podcast have raised the the critical issue of the CMO being the, the, the orchestrator and the collaborator across different functions, like you've said, so HR, ops, technology, to try and try and help join things together. Because um, the, the problem is, once you create once you create silos and you create heads of departments, those people tend to focus on their departments and what they deliver, as opposed to how they contribute to, to other parts of the organisation. So. I have a question for you on this, actually, Ben. Like, how, how do you determine how much time to spend on building those partnerships around the rest of the board table with working with your team and upskilling them with, with, with actually getting hands-on dirty with the customer experience and advertising and CRM and everything else? There's, a, there's clearly a lot that a marketer needs to touch these days. And if you're trying to change the org, the culture, the way of doing things and get stuff out the door, some, you could, I guess it must be quite difficult to prioritize. Yeah, it's kind of a 60, 30, 10, I would okay. say. So, so a huge amount of time, the 60, um, uh, working with um, peers and colleagues and other functions and, and making sure that there's clear strategy and um, there's alignment between the different functional areas. Um, that's massively important. The reason why it's 60 is there's just a lot of meetings involved in that. Right. And the 30 is probably more around the team. I'm assuming you've got, you know, a fabulous set of direct reports who you've recruited and trained and um, empowered and delegated authority to, to kind of get on and do stuff. Um, then really, you know, it's a day and a half a week, right? It, you know, they, you, you need to be checking in with them, but they should be doing their job. They shouldn't be bringing their problems to you. They should be trying to solve their problems and escalating stuff when it really needs help. Yeah. Um, and the 10 is, you know, um, is keeping your hand in. Um, you know, I, I, I always, you know, I, I very rarely in my last few years at Royal Mail would, would, would go to an agency for a creative presentation, what have you. But I would be, you know, in touch with on, on some of the major campaigns or the campaigns that weren't performing, I would certainly get involved yeah. um, and try and, and help um, the managers work through the problems based on the experience that I've got. I wouldn't try and solve it for them necessarily. Um, yeah. I wouldn't have time to be able to follow through. But, um, but, but, you know, sit down and kind of, you know, let's say, uh, I don't know, the performance um, in, in, in one area was you know, either st <clears throat> staying still or getting worse and it should have been getting better, then you might sit down with them and talk about their model that they're using. And is that model actually the right model for the market at the moment? Or do they need to shift it uh, into a different media or acquisition model? Uh, and just prompt and, 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 and push them to do that. But again, yeah, it's, it, that, that's not, you know, maybe a couple of days a month. It's not, it's not massive, but I'm personally, for me, those were the kind of quite invigorating meetings. Yeah. Um, where you could you could you could kind of you know, step back into those old shoes that were quite comfy, um, yeah. and you know you can you you can you know move around with a degree of ease, um, uh, and kind of you know and, and kind of re-energize a little bit um, yeah. before you have to kind of sit down with the, the CTO and talk about you know system security and cyber threats and um, why you need to build out a different technology uh, way of working. No, no, that, I think it's really interesting for people to hear that kind of split and how how you, how you have to kind of split up your time because I think particularly agency people I think often think that a high proportion of time is spent on thinking about paid media but it's like if, if it's only 10% at that end then it's only a fraction of that 10% that's being put onto thinking about paid media and advertising which I think is a, a good thing for for those those folks listening that are agency side to think about. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, I mean, I guess, I guess, what I would say is, I mean, it does depend on the time of the year. So, 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 you know, classically, you'd have a big planning round where stuff was pulled together, and 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 in general, in general, I would make sure that I was fairly heavily involved with my DRs in pulling up our what I would call our operating plan together. Um, but then once that's done, it really is just dipping in and checking in to make sure it's working. Um, because you know the whole point of having a team is that the team get on and do the work 
um, yeah. and they you know and they need it yeah and, and i think there's something interesting like hearing hearing what you're saying and something that i recognized in lots of transformation projects is you you need to dip in to to be able to see some of the insights and see some of the nuggets for yourself to be able to bring them back as proof points for the transformation because if you're all you're ever doing is operating at that transformation level you become a bit like a consultant where, where you write the decks and the strategy but you don't have a real sense of what's going on um, yeah how, how yeah how, how, yeah how do you how do you, how, do you, how do you advise marketeers to to kind of keep enough of a enough of a kind of connection point with what's going on in their business to be able to bring it back as proof points but also bring the outside in because like having the time based on what you've talked about to actually keep up and read and attend conferences and everything else must be pretty challenging. Yeah, no, it is. I mean, I think so. So people talk about kind of, you know, stepping onto the balcony and looking down. I, I, I know it's a terrible analogy. I, I often see myself much more as a lifeguard in the swimming pool. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm perched up, but I can jump in pretty quick if I need to. Um, and, uh, and you rescue people, and then you jump back up onto your seat and you keep a watching brief. Um, and, and so that's, I've now got uh, an image yeah. of you in swimming shorts, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> what a thought, what a thought. Um, so, uh, so, so that, that, that that's the kind of, um, the, the way I would, I would describe it. I, I mean, key here is uh, yeah, the dreaded word governance, but it is hugely important. And by governance, I mean, is how are decisions made? Um, and I think, you know, setting projects up, transformations up, programs up, properly to begin with and being really really clear on where decisions are made and who makes those decisions yeah. is absolutely vital um and and it's something that, that that i've learned the hard way actually by not setting up good governance on things and finding out that you're suddenly in a world of a court of infinite appeal later down the line where you think you've got sign off but somebody else has which is a nightmare um, it's a nightmare for, for suppliers, for agencies and partners, because they actually don't know who their client is, because they don't know who they're actually presenting to. They've got sign off from somebody, but actually it appears that person isn't the person who is really signing it off. So being clear on governance is massively, massively important. And it's time very, very well spent up front, being crystal clear where accountability lies, where responsibility for task lies, uh, and who is actually going to do the work. Yeah. Um, and, and kind of and, and and what those forums are that you manage the governance through. So on big, you know, I, I did a big uh, digital transformation project, um, replatforming uh, the Royal Mail website uh, a couple of years ago. Um, you know, it was on a 2008 platform, didn't render to mobile. Um, everything was outsourced to um, a, a tech company, so we couldn't really do much in house. Cost a fortune. I was literally a hundred thousand pounds just to change a template on a page. It would take five weeks. I mean, just, you couldn't, you couldn't do anything. Mm. Um, but, but, <laughs> and, and, and the platform was out of service, which when you've got a million visitors a day was not a great place to be from a cyber security perspective. Um, so, but you know, when you're, when you're, when we set that project up, um, you know, there were a couple of layers of governance to it. Um, and I, you know, I, I was, you know, I chaired the steering board that oversaw that did, you know, had to deal with all the problems and manage all the stakeholders and what have you. But it's where issues were escalated to, which meant that I could dive down into the detail if I really needed to um, and try and sort out things. It's, it was the escalation point. Yeah. Um, and, and, but I think, you know, uh, and, and, and that was, you know, it was a really, I'll be honest with you, Paul, it was a very, very difficult project, partly because we were running it as an agile project in, a, in an organisation that had never run an agile project before. Um, yeah. So everything was kind of water. Oh, and I can imagine like in a, in a world where there's increasing cross-functional kind of requirements and cross departments working on projects, actually the, the decision-making process and the racy model is, is ever more important. Otherwise, you're trying to achieve agility and actually what you've got is decisions not being made and things delivered more slowly um yeah but you but you need to have a you need the governance models <clears throat> i mean you've got to you know the the, the top board is, is kind of noses in and hands out right so you 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 you're, you're looking at stuff you're studying it you're challenging you're questioning um but you're not trying to run it from the steer curve um because that's 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 just a nightmare you need to have oppos that are delegated to kind of get on and do stuff but equally 
you know, they need to come to you and say, look, we just can't get this function to do this. Can you please help us? And of course, that's what you're there for uh, in many respects, because you've built those relationships over time and you're able to sit down with the right people in technology or HR or wherever it is and try and unblock some of the issues. Um, so, yeah, you know, it's, it, it, you know, it, it, it's gone. Yeah. That's a lot of sense. So, we're coming towards the end of the interview, so I'd love, I'd love to get your, your reflection on like, maybe your marketing career up till now or even just the last few years. Is there, is there something that you personally like, are working on or are thinking about that you need to do more as a senior marketer? Because I think it's always good for people to hear that everyone's constantly learning and improving. So I just wondered if there was one or multiple things that you you focus on developing yourself in right now? <laughs> so that's quite a few actually. Um, I, think, um, I think having a really good understanding on um, where well, the things that technology can do for people. I, I'm less interested in actually how physically how the technology works, but I'm very interested in what it enables. Um, and, uh, and, and, and but this is purely and selfishly from the context of how can I extract more value from customers? That's really all I'm interested in. Um, and I think over over the years, the thing that that, that has that I I sort of progressively got much more uh, I spent more time kind of reading about and trying to understand is something that's got nothing to do with advertising actually, um, but it's got a lot to do with marketing, which is pricing. Um, you know, you know, I came up on the on the kind of creative side of the world and the, and the yeah. media side, uh, not not so much on the pricing side. And uh, and I think I think I think you're getting this amazing opportunity now with technology, where you've got this tiny technology can be this tiny thin layer between customers and what they need, and you can extract a huge amount of value if you approach that in the right way. And quite often, one of the biggest levers to being successful is in your pricing and by successful i mean yeah, that's a great point you know, making make, making money um and, and, and i think one of the four, it's one of the four p's isn't it one of the four p's yeah of marketing. yeah it is but it quite often it gets hived off into product or into you know sometimes True. finance which isn't a great place for it to be um but you know i i i, I you know I, I i'm constantly interested you know and over the last kind of you know 10 15 20 years you know subscriptions really kind of come up i mean everything is subscription now yeah. Um, you know, your software is, your, you know, your utilities are, your mobile phone. I mean, everything is, is subscription, um, which is, which is you know, very different from 20, 20 years ago. Um, but I think the next, the next bit that is very different, and there's a guy called Marco Bettini who, who, who's just written a good book on this, actually, called The Ends Game. Yeah. And Marco's, Marco's a great um, uh, marketing professor. I, I, luckily, I, I, he taught me um, very briefly a few years ago. He was quite inspiring. And he, he, you know, and, and he's kind of going, you know, do people buy schooling or, or are they prepared to pay more for education? And you kind of go, that's really conceptually mm. interesting. Yeah. With the way that technology can deliver education today, um, a rounded education. And, and how do you price for that? Because you don't price yeah. it on a cost plus model. No. Right. There, there is a there is a value there is a value model there that is really really interesting, and I, and I just think there's I think I think you know we're moving to a world where more and more commercial organisations are going to be thinking in that way, you know I'm not gonna I'm not gonna I'm not gonna charge you, um, you know uh, for seeing a consultant uh, or having an operation I, you know my charging model is going to be based around you being in good health, right, and having a healthy life. And I just, I just think it's a very, very interesting switch. And, and pricing is, you know, and Marco describes it as, you know, you've got your product on one side of the room and you've got your customer on the other side of the room. And price is usually the thing that can pull the two closer together. Um, and what, what levers that you're using um, can, can you know, knock down barriers to, to, to um, accessing or consumption of the product. And I think, I think that's, a, it's, it, for me, it's, it's sort of, yeah, the next area that's going to be really, really exciting is what different models are people going to use? And, and that will have a massive impact on how people communicate, how they build their brand, what their propositions are, which I think is, you know, absolutely yeah. uh, fascinating. 
I think, no, I think it's a really powerful point. And as you say, it's actually intrinsic in a lot of the D2C models. It's just maybe not talked about <laughs> as a pricing strategy um, yeah. right now. But, um, <laughs> it's been hugely, hugely insightful chatting to you um, as always. And I think you've taken us right back to where we started, which was there is no such thing as normal. And actually the role of marketing is to keep their, keep their finger on the pulse of everything that's changing both inside and outside the business and to try to make sense of it and to strategize for the, the short and long term um, and, and use technology to enable connection with customers and understanding customers, but not to rely on technology as the strategy. Um, so thank you, Ben. All that remains is for me to uh, appreciate your time. No worries. I've really enjoyed speaking to you, Paul. I'll speak to you again soon. Thank you for tuning into this latest podcast. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, we'll be back again very soon interviewing a senior marketer and understanding what they would like to reset in the marketing industry. In the meantime, if you want to check out me, uh, you can find me on Twitter, Paul underscore Framp, and you can find my new business, which is a hybrid marketing consultancy helping with in-housing, digital strategy uh, and marketing attribution at controlvexposed.co.uk on Twitter under CVE or on LinkedIn under controlvexposed. Look forward to you coming back next time and having more interesting conversations. Thank you.